It's a link to the past and the future, as Zelda 2 arrives at last on NES with NES Works episode 105. It's been quite a wait, hasn't it? I kicked off NES Works 1988 back in July 2020 with Renegade, and now here we are finally at the end of the year with Zelda 2. But really, that's just keeping it real. If you're old enough to remember the NES's heyday, you'll recall that the real world wait for Zelda 2 to arrive took very nearly as long. A running theme throughout recent episodes of NES Works has centered on the uncertainty surrounding the release dates of minigames from 1988. Last episode featured two of those, with Bomberman and Othello. With Zelda 2, we get to the crux of the matter. The NES simply became too popular for its own good. 1988 saw Nintendo beset by a chip shortage that caused games to ship belatedly, and sometimes in ridiculously small numbers. The system exploded in popularity in the US throughout late 1987 and all of 88, and Nintendo found itself unable to either source or manufacture enough cartridges to meet demand. I don't think I've ever seen a definitive statement on the precise nature of the problem, but it undeniably affected release dates. Surprisingly, it seemed to affect first-party releases most of all. Normally, Nintendo is quick to throw third parties under the bus in order to protect its own business interests, but multiple Nintendo published titles slipped throughout 1988, far more dramatically than third-party games did. Super Mario Bros. 2, for example, had originally been announced for an early to mid-88 ship date but didn't show up on shelves until October. However, no game took it on the chin quite so brutally as Zelda 2. Looking back at Computer Entertainer magazine, it appears that Nintendo of America announced an American release for Zelda 2 around the same time that the original Zelda launched, at Summer CES 1987. The plan appears to have been to launch Zelda in Summer 87 and then Zelda 2 early in 88. But here we are in December 88 and Zelda 2 has only just arrived and in scarce quantities. Once again, there's some debate over the game's precise arrival date at American Retail. While modern online sources almost universally cited as a December 1988 release, the November 1988 issue of Computer Entertainer indicated that it had already hit stores, albeit in such small quantities and with a restock date set for early the following year that Nintendo may as well have just called it a January 89 game. By the time it hit the US, in fact, Nintendo had been promoting it for nearly a year and a half. The US version of Zelda may well be the first ever American video game release to see extensive coverage of its repeated delays, and Nintendo's own constant hype generation for Zelda 2 amplified the issue. Honestly, Zelda 2's inextricable relationship between its delays and Nintendo's sustained print coverage demands a change in format for this episode. That's right, it's time to ask ourselves, what did Nintendo Power say? Zelda 2's coverage actually precedes the existence of Nintendo Power. After all, the Japanese version hit Disk System at the beginning of 1987, and its localization was surely a foregone conclusion. Nintendo dedicated its third issue of the Fun Club newsletter from fall 1987 to the original Zelda, and toward the back of that issue it included a small preview of the sequel, featuring a monochromatic drawing of that game's more mature version of Link. The next issue of Fun Club News dedicated a full page to a teaser packed with screenshots, as did the issue after that. Around that same time, Nintendo published its official Nintendo Player's Guidebook, which included extensive maps and tips for Zelda 2, seemingly a full year before the game's actual arrival. Fun Club News issue 6, dated April-May 1988, gave Zelda 2 its cover feature and another extensive three-page spread which included a hand-drawn overworld map and simple maps of the first three palaces. With the final issue of the Fun Club news, Nintendo began walking back its hype a bit. The only mention of Zelda 2 appears in a small blurb that marks Nintendo's first mention of a chip shortage. That same information also appears in the first issue of Nintendo Power, which barely mentions Zelda 2, but does include a blowout feature on the first Zelda's second quest, which I speculate the editorial team possibly shoehorned into the magazine in place of yet another tantalizing mega feature on this eternally delayed sequel. Finally, issue 3 of Nintendo Power, dated January-February 89, meaning it would have arrived in mailboxes in December of 88, 
makes Zelda 2 its cover item and revisits the game with a staggering 17-page feature that presents much more detailed dungeon maps through the fourth palace, extensive explanations of game mechanics, and even bits of lore and other extraneous fluff. Nintendo Power's coverage didn't end there, though. The following issue devoted another seven pages to the game, offering detailed maps of the fifth and sixth palaces while giving players helpful step-by-step -step guidance to the final dungeon, the Great Palace. Combine these two issues and you practically have an entire strategy guide. What little information Nintendo Power didn't reveal in its two features would be laid bare in future issues of the magazine, whose tips sections provided pointers for conquering the Great Palace and even detailed strategies for vanquishing the final boss. In short, Nintendo Power wrung every last possible drop of coverage from this game. So, what about Zelda 2 makes it so special? Why did Nintendo give it a shiny golden cartridge like its predecessor, break down every inch of the game in exhaustive detail through the pages of its house magazine, and generally bang the hype drum for two solid years? Simply put, Zelda 2 represents a huge step forward in terms of the maturation of action games in general, and in terms of the complexity of Nintendo's own creations specifically. Zelda 2 has plenty of precedent, but it brings together a huge variety of influences and applies the impressive level of polish players had come to expect from first-party NES releases. Zelda 2 quickly became one of the most influential games of the 8-bit era, a fact that its late US release somewhat obscured for American players. Having debuted nearly two years earlier in Japan, in January 1987, Zelda 2 helped inspire a number of games that, ironically, beat it to shelves in the US. Without Zelda 2, there may well have been no Rambo, no Simon's Quest, no Bionic Commando, no Blaster Master. Some of these games draw on Zelda 2 more overtly than others, Rambo in particular, but all of them, even the Metroid-like Blaster Master, owe a debt to Zelda 2's structure, progression, and mechanics. Zelda 2 influenced future games as well, from the spiritually similar Wonder Boy the Dragon's Trap for Master System to The Battle of Olympus, whose designer has stated directly that he wanted to create a game in the same style. Zelda 2, in turn, saw Nintendo's designers pulling together game concepts that had been floating around in the ether for years. Just as the original Zelda clearly owes a debt to Falcom's Dragon Slayer games and Namco's Tower of Duraga, Zelda 2 seems to draw its viewpoint and format from Falcom's Romancia, Dragon Slayer Jr., and Namco's Dragon Buster. At the same time, Zelda 2 sees Nintendo truly leaning into role-playing mechanics for the first time. The original Zelda abstracted role-playing concepts into an action format similarly to Atari's Adventure, but Zelda 2 goes a few steps further. It incorporates experience points, stat categories and level-up boosts, inventory items, skill enhancements, and magic spells and mana points into its sandbox. It's a proper action RPG, and while it does continue to carry forward the first game's use of physical hard container tokens for life upgrades as well as magic upgrades, Link's inherent skills also develop as he gains experience through defeating foes. Slaying an enemy or collecting certain items nets you experience points, and once you reach certain experience milestones, the game allows you to upgrade a stat. Life boosts your endurance, causing enemy attacks to inflict less damage, effectively replacing the red and blue rings from the first game. Magic improves your mana efficiency so that each spell costs less magic power to cast. And attack improves your physical strength, causing you to inflict more damage against enemies when you strike a foe. While you can also extend your life and magic meters by collecting certain items, you can only enhance your strength through experience. This move into extensive skill growth systems comes hand in hand with an even more dramatic change from the original Zelda. Combat-oriented gameplay in Zelda 2 now plays out through a side-scrolling format, and Link now has a jump button in place of the first game's tool button. The top-down view of the original hasn't entirely vanished here, but it plays a very different role in the game. Rather than comprising the primary mode of gameplay, Zelda 2's overworld view now simply gives you a zoomed out viewpoint in which to move around the world. When you enter towns, dungeons, key map points, or encounter spaces with wandering enemies, the viewpoint switches to an up-close side view. This seems almost undeniably inspired by Dragon Quest, which had debuted on Famicom just a few months after the first Zelda shipped for disk system, and it simultaneously reverses the roles of Falcom Xanadu. In Xanadu, you moved around the world in a side-on perspective and switched to an overhead proto-Zelda viewpoint when you entered dungeons. Here the reverse is true, and no combat or item collection takes place in the bird's eye segments. 
The only action you can take besides walking while traversing the map is to smash objects with a hammer. By which I mean rocks and trees, not enemies. The shift to a zoomed out perspective on Hyrule allows this game to place Link in a far more extensive piece of geography. Midway through the game you encounter a small grove designed in the style of the original game's Hyrule, which defines a much larger scale for this adventure. And that's before you head across the sea to a second continent. More than 30 years later, Zelda II remains the only time the franchise has made use of this format and the side-scrolling action, outside of the little dungeon passages in Link's Awakening. A Link to the Past for Super NES returned to the top-down combat of the first game, and subsequent 2D Zeldas all followed suit. This has given Zelda II a reputation for being a black sheep, much like the other weird second games on the NES. Think Super Mario Bros. 2 and Castlevania 2. But as with those games, Zelda II's creators have hardly disowned this entry, and future chapters of the franchise would borrow plenty from it. Although the Dragon Buster style of combat didn't continue through Zelda in its 2D iterations, the series drew heavily upon Zelda II's swordplay once it shifted into the third dimension with Ocarina of Time. Top-down combat in the Zelda games has never offered much in the way of nuance, whereas Zelda II adopted a highly technical approach to combat that seems heavily inspired by the work of Takeshi Nishiyama at Irem and Capcom. Nintendo's internal teams went hands-on with Nishiyama's work when they ported Kung Fu to NES in 1985. That game's follow-up, Trojan, shipped to arcades in spring 1986, right around the time that Nintendo began work on Zelda II. The similarities are hard to ignore. As in Nishiyama's work, Zelda II involves fighting foes with high and low attacks. As in Trojan, self-defense in the form of a shield also factors heavily into the mix. This becomes the basis of much of the action. Link runs and jumps in the Mario style, but his encounters with foes involve in-close fighting in which you need to block attacks with your shield while looking for openings in the enemy's defense. Just as he can attack high and low, Link holds his shield at two different heights, protecting his face and torso, or blocking attacks directed at his legs. As in the first Zelda, you automatically defend while in your neutral stance, only lowering your shield to strike. The game's most challenging encounters involve going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, not with towering bosses, but rather with opponents who fight Link as an equal. Various forms of knights who can also strike and defend at two heights. Every entanglement with these warriors brings the game briefly to a dead stop for a tense duel, as you try to defend against their strikes while seeking opportunities to slip and attack past their defenses. Enemy knights range from the pitiful skeletons, a new take on the original Stalfos, to the different ranks of dark nuts now called iron knuckles that guard the palaces. Certain caves are patrolled by Lizalfos knights, some of whom swing or even toss heavy maces that your standard shield can't block. Worst of all are the horrible Foca Eagle Knights that patrol the Great Palace and make the game's final dungeon a harrowing journey into hell. Each new warrior type you encounter demands greater skill and higher experience and stat levels, putting Link's and the player's abilities to the test until you finally reach the game's true final boss, Shadow Link, who possesses all of Link's physical combat capabilities and presses a merciless attack. Still, Link has two advantages working in his favor. First, the fact that he's controlled by a human player who ostensibly possesses the ability to learn and eventually play better. Secondly, Link himself gains capabilities beyond raw stat gains over the course of the adventure. While he never acquires replacement for his gear, he does master secondary techniques that grant him significant combat advantages. Along the course of his journey, a pair of veteran swordsmen teach Link how to attack along a vertical axis with an upward and downward sword thrust. The latter of these results in a sort of trampoline effect that Capcom would use as the entire basis for Scrooge McDuck's pogo attacks and ducktails. On top of that, Link also has access to a secondary skill set, just as in the first game. Here, those skills take the form of magic spells rather than combat tools. Although you do collect a few tools like the hammer, they work in a strictly non-offensive capacity. Instead, you activate spells to enhance your battle readiness. Some of these function as utility powers, like granting you the ability to briefly jump higher or transform into a fairy in order to slip through keyholes. Others, however, have a direct effect on combat. You can cast the Shield Spell, which doubles your defense. Fire, which allows you to blast flames from the tip of your weapon. Reflect, which enhances your shield's durability and sends magic spells back toward their caster. And even Lightning, which delivers enormous damage to all enemies on screen, destroying most in a single blast. Link acquires spells and combat skills in the towns that dot the land, and many of whose names, Ruto, Saria, Naboru, 
would resurface as the sages in Ocarina of Time. Towns work here much as they do in other role-playing games. They generally offer Link a safe haven from enemies where NPCs will offer hints, provide aid, and grant you boons in exchange for your assistance. The villagers here behave pretty similarly to those in Castlevania 2, though fortunately they rarely lie, and you won't find any shopkeepers, since the game lacks an economy, another difference from the rest of the Zelda franchise. Certain villagers will replenish Link's health or magic, including the young women who invite him indoors for a Golgo 13-esque hit point refill. There are exceptions to the safe haven rule, however. Certain villagers turn out to be Ganon's spies, who will transform into bats and attempt to attack. And as in Dragon Quest, one town has been abandoned and become overrun by monsters, which are invisible until you acquire the correct tool for spotting hidden foes. Unlike in Dragon Quest, however, Link doesn't otherwise stumble into unseen enemies. Even in the overworld view, the monsters that attempt to attack you during your travels appear on the map as icons. In the monster icons, you can see one of the major differences between the Japanese and Western releases of Zelda 2. Nintendo made some quality of life tweaks to the game during its localization process. The map monsters are the least significant of these, changing from balloon-like blobs that are presumably meant to evoke Hitodama into small slime icons for weak encounters and upright monster shapes for tough encounters. More significantly, the Western releases of the game make some subtle but helpful changes to the experience leveling systems. In both versions, Link can raise each of his three stats from level 1 to level 8, and each stat has a different EXP threshold for its levels. Magic is the least expensive stat to upgrade, while strength is the most. The game prompts you to upgrade when you hit an experience threshold, but you can choose to forego a level up at that point in favor of saving your experience for the next opportunity. This amounts to a highly streamlined process for allowing players to build Link to their preferences and determine which attributes to focus on. A small nod to player choice within the context of a minimalist action-oriented take on role-playing. The Japanese version of Zelda 2 hobbled that freedom of choice by resetting all of Link's stat levels to be even with the lowest stat whenever you continued from a save. Which is to say that if you decided to build Link's health to the max at the expense of other skills, that level 8 health stat would reset to level 1 when you loaded up your next session. It's a weirdly punitive system that they wisely changed for the US and European versions, especially since the highest EXP levels can be so difficult to lock down. Again, unlike in any other Zelda game, Zelda 2 has lives. You get three lives per continue, and while you retain your progress and in inventory and experience levels when you run out of lives, pressing continue sends you back to the starting point of the game with all your uninvested experience points to date reset to zero. Woe we'll betide the player on the brink of earning an expensive level 8 upgrade, only to run out of lives and have to start over again. Dealing with the level flattening system on top of that mechanic really was a bridge too far. As for that starting point, Link begins his quest in front of a Deus, where Princess Zelda lays under the influence of a sleeping spell. This is, curiously, not the same Princess Zelda you saved in the first game, although it certainly would have made perfect sense for Ganon's forces to have sought revenge for his defeat by putting a curse on the princess. Instead, the manual devotes several pages to a bizarrely elaborate backstory in which Link comes of age and discovers that there's a third Triforce out in the wilds of Hyrule, and also that the original Princess Zelda, the one currently napping, was cursed centuries ago, and all the other princesses to have come along since then have been named Zelda in her honor, and only now can she be awakened by the chosen hero Link. Link has to accomplish this by traveling to six palaces and inserting crystals into a statue deep inside each palace, which will lower the barrier around another, bigger palace where that third Triforce awaits. This will awaken the Sleeping Princess, at which point I guess Hyrule now has two Princess Zeldas just kinda hanging around. Talk about a constitutional crisis. Meanwhile, Ganon's forces are on the move to resurrect their boss by killing Link and sprinkling his blood on Ganon's ashes. Whatever, it's all nonsense. The important thing is that you need to travel the width and breadth of Hyrule, uncovering the path to each temple, and speaking with the villagers to acquire the abilities and tools you need in order to progress. Deep inside each of the temples you explore, you'll find a guardian blocking access to the statue where you need to set one of your crystals. In just about every case, you can only reach or defeat these bosses by mastering one of the skills you've acquired en route to their palace. For example, in order to defeat the mounted knight Ribanak, you need to use Link's downward sword thrust to knock the warrior from his steed. The wizard Karak bombards you with beams of magical force, similar to those wielded by wizrobes in the original Zelda, 
but casting Reflect on your shield doesn't simply protect you, it redirects those beams back to their caster, who otherwise can't be hurt. You will of course recognize this learn and utilize methodology from, well, basically every Zelda game made after Zelda 2. Link to the Past codified the system by requiring that Link would always need a dungeon's treasure in order to defeat its boss. But Zelda 2 laid the groundwork, albeit in a less constrained way. Here, gaining the abilities to defeat a palace boss doesn't happen quite so tidily as in the self-contained puzzle boxes of later Zelda games. Rather, the world surrounding the palaces plays an equally significant role in Link's growth and progression. Honestly, after decades of Zelda games adhering to the Link to the Past formula, which only A Link Between Worlds and Breath of the Wild have made an effort to break away from, returning to Zelda 2 makes for a refreshing change of pace. To be sure, it's by no means a perfect game. A few of the puzzles to progression have solutions far too obscure for their own good, such as the town hidden in the woods you can only find by using the hammer's unmentioned secondary function as an axe to break down trees on a very specific single tile of the overworld. The combat can be merciless, being thrown back to the outset of the game when you run out of lives forces you to spend a lot of time retracing your steps to where you were. It's the kind of game where you end up playing in a non-optimal pattern in order to save yourself a lot of hassle. For example, it takes an incredibly long time to build up enough EXP to earn those final skill levels. At the same time, placing a gem in a palace of statue instantly boosts your EXP to the next level, and you don't actually need to place those crystals until you finally want to unlock the Great Palace. This means that one of the main exploits for easy late game leveling in Zelda 2 is to beat the palace bosses without placing the crystals until you want to earn your last few stat boosts, then returning to the statues and getting instant level ups. It's just a, a little clunky. Still, it's a strong game, especially in the context of its Japanese release date. The closest thing in the console market to Zelda 2 at that point was Sunsoft's Wing of Medulla, which also did the Dragon Buster thing a few weeks before Nintendo released this game, but did it a whole lot more clumsily. Even at the end of 1988, Zelda 2 still stands out as a huge, complex, groundbreaking game, even if its localization delays meant that some of its groundbreaking thunder had been stolen by games designed in its image but localized first. The two-year gap between the Japanese and US release will do that, especially in an era when console game design was making massive, rapid leaps toward maturation. Flawed, yes. Brilliant, also yes. Zelda 2 showcases an experimental side of Nintendo and a surprising willingness to take chance with an established mega brand to take it in unexpected directions. Zelda 2 may ultimately have proven to be something of an evolutionary dead end, but many of its concepts and themes would seep into the series down the road. And it did a great deal to define how arcade action and role-playing concepts could coexist together in a coherent way. Next time on NES Works, we enter 1989. But before we get there, I need to bring Master System's chronology up to speed with NES. So it's going to be a while. So until then, please look forward to Star Soldier when NES Works returns in late 2023.